Hi, Brian. I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Oh, my pleasure. Totally my pleasure. Um, maybe you could just kick off by giving a brief introduction to The Dissident for those who don't know anything about the film. What can they expect if they decide to watch this documentary? Uh, well, The Dissident, um, I like to think of as a, as a cinematic uh, thriller, I guess a, a docu-thriller, uh, that explores the life and death of Jamal Khashoggi uh, inside uh, the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October of 2018. And uh, I like to think of the film as the untold story behind the murder uh, of Jamal Khashoggi and the lives of those that impacted. We follow his fiance, <clears throat> Hatija Jengas, um, on her journey following the year uh, uh, after Jamal's death and of Omar Abdulaziz, uh, the young Saudi dissident uh, who's, who is and was living in self-exile uh, in Montreal, who was working with Jamal Khashoggi uh, right before his death, uh, and is arguably one of the, the key reasons uh, why Mohammed bin Salman chose to murder uh, Jamal. So um, that kind of uh, captures the essence uh, of the film. and. Uh, and the film plays uh, like a cinematic thriller, um, except for the fact that it is a documentary and, uh, and everything that is in the film is, uh, is, is true and authentic. Uh, and uh, um, yeah. And I believe you started it, you know, kind of just after you got your Oscar for Icarus back in 2017, it was three years in the making. So why did you decide to tackle this topic um, for your follow-up documentary? And what was the experience of making it over those three years? Uh, well, I Icarus um, was, uh, took me uh, three, three and a half years to make. And, um, and that was a very organic journey um, that if you see the film, it, it starts on one path of, you know, me setting out to do one thing and ends up taking a, 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 a crazy pivot into the world of this, you know, massive doping scandal uh, that had been carried on uh, over decades uh, by Russia. Uh, in, in The Dissident, um, I set out and started making that film uh, just very shortly after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, really in November of 2018. Um, and the film, uh, you know, was completed in about a, uh, truly completed in about a year and a half's time. Uh, but, you know, from the outset, um, you know, I, uh, I knew the story that I was telling, and then it was really uh, putting together all those pieces and working very closely. And so uh, with the lives of, of those impacted and following them on their journey, which was unpredictable, but the facts of the murder um, were already there. But you know, I was I was impassioned to, to to tell this story and take this on as my next project is, um, you know, I seek to tell stories that tell truth to power, um, and in the story of Jamal, uh, here was a, a 60 year old journalist. Uh, he did not consider himself a dissident, uh, a writer who had spent most of his life working for the Saudi government, um, who wanted and believed that his country could be a better place. Uh, and under the leadership of Mohammed bin Salman, uh, he saw many things uh, to be concerned about. Uh, and he saw his country uh, headed in, in what he viewed as the wrong direction. Uh, and, and he chose, uh, rather than to be silenced, which we get you know, into uh, in, in pretty great detail, uh, you know, in, in the film, um, uh, he chose instead uh, to move to Washington uh, to put himself into self-exile um, so that he could continue to write freely, so that he could continue to have a voice. Um, and in doing this, um, it ends up uh, in his own murder and, and horrific murder. Um, this man was not a threat to Saudi Arabia. Uh, this man was a, you know, uh, a, a, a moderate ob uh, objector. He, he was a man uh, who, you know, who uh, had spent his life, um, uh, you know, having uh, 
political, you know, writing about politics and writing about government, um, and in seeing his country going down what he viewed as the wrong path, um, it leads to his own murder. Um, and this story to me just uh, felt like uh, something that I wanted to take on and uh, and try to shine a, a bigger life on and let people understand not only who Jamal Khashoggi was as a person, uh, but what he was speaking about and the impact uh, that his life has had on uh, on so many others and continues to have. And you mentioned there kind of at the beginning about it being more like a thriller really than a documentary and there are many uh, moments where it feels stranger than fiction. Um, so were there things that surprised you, you know, even as you were going along the way, how did you get this incredible amount of access? And I'm thinking in particular of the transcript that you managed to get hold of, which I think has some of the most shocking details. And, you know, maybe what was the decision behind not having us actually hear that for ourselves? I mean, perhaps if the, seeing the transcript was perhaps enough. Well, th there, was a, there was a decision made. Um, we're about a year into making the film. Uh, I've been working closely, uh, which was, you know, some extraordinary trust building uh, that had take, taken place uh, between myself and my team uh, and the Turkish government. Um, and in being able to, to fully tell the story, uh, I employed uh, Turkey uh, to trust me with the full transcript. And, and, and the transcript of, of Jamal's murder uh, you know, to this day uh, has not been released or has not been made public other than to, you know, intelligence agencies. Um, and so in, in Turkey providing me uh, with this uh, and, and reading and understanding it, um, I felt and still feel uh, that what we have in the film and what we craft is more than enough. Uh, to use the audio of a man uh, being horrifically murdered um, is gratuitous. It doesn't serve any purpose. We all know that Jamal was murdered. We all know that he met a, a, a horrific ending to his life. So instead, we used those words and the real words of those transcripts and what was happening as he was murdered uh, and crafted a scene kind of in a Hitchcockian, you know, way of using sound and light um, and kind of sensory uh, experiences to hopefully bring the viewer into that kind of those horrific moments and use those words of what was being spoken as Jamal was being murdered to shock rather than to hear a man uh, 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 being murdered, which to me not only felt gratuitous, um, I, I wouldn't want Hatija Jengas, his fiance, Omar, his friends, his family, anybody to have to hear that. I don't think it serves any purpose. And there's a line, I think it's from a US senator, something to the effect of, you know, you can cut a distant into pieces with a bone saw and we still, we give them weapons. So I, I think at the heart of this documentary, there's the personal tragedy, and we see that from the point of view of his fiance, but there's also something incredibly chilling about the idea that people with money and power can act with impunity. So what are your reflections on that? And do you think the report being released by Biden could be a turning point? You know, uh, I, 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 I think what, what we see uh, in, in the film uh, and what is, um, uh, you know, very, very evident um, and honestly, uh, you know, to told in the film um, is, uh, uh, is, is a story of how money and, you know, trillions of dollars in wealth um, basically supersedes human rights and that all this money and power and business interests uh, ultimately can allow you to get away with murder. And, uh, and Biden's releasing uh, of, of the report, um, while it served a purpose of maybe giving some sort of uh, closure um, to, you know, to, to the crime in the sense of, we all knew that Mohammed bin Salman ordered the crime. If you see the film, you walk away going, well, of course, who else could have ordered this? It's impossible 
that you could pull off an operation like this without the um, the permission and authority of of the crown prince, leader of that country. Um, but uh, but in Biden's response, which is to do nothing, um, he simply is following in the Trump playbook, in the members of the G20 playbook, in the United Nations playbook, and everything that we see in the film, which is okay, uh, these behaviors might give you a slap on the wrist, but they ultimately will be tolerated in the face of our business interests um, and political alignment. Um, and, that's, and, and that's sad. I think, I think we've lost something as, 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 as humanity uh, to, uh, to allow money to take precedent over human lives. And just quickly, you know, what do you hope the impact of, of this documentary to be, I guess, in the public being able to see this and judge it for themselves, but also, you know, pressure perhaps on, on our leaders. Um, and, you know, like, what, yeah, what impact do you want the, um, the, the film to have? You know, uh, I, I think the impact that it's having is already, you know, in, in, in talking to you and being able to uh, give interviews about the film and uh, in, in knowing that Hatija and Omar are proud of the film and that more and more people around the world are going to be able to watch the film and see the film and form their own opinions. And I think all of that ultimately can lead to, um, to change and hopefully uh, a better place uh, for so many in Saudi Arabia uh, who suffer under these terrible abuses. Um, but I'm not certainly tied to what that means. I think, I think that for me as a storyteller and a filmmaker, um, you know, I, I can only do the best that I can um, to craft a story and a piece of cinema. And what the takeaway and the outcome of that is beyond my control. So I can't, um, I can't consume myself with those thoughts other than to be grateful uh, that the film is being seen and that I'm able to, to do press uh, uh, and spread the message of the film and hope that others will find it uh, and have a, a visceral and emotional response and tell their friends and their friends tell their friends and perhaps all of that collective action uh, can bring about uh, change to create better lives uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, and others that suffer under human rights violations. And you don't fear for any repercussions for yourself, I assume. No. Oh, good. All right. Hey. Thank you. I think I'm out yeah. of time, but thank you so much for speaking with us and for this incredible, really powerful documentary. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks. Much Brian. appreciated. Cheers. Bye. Sarah.